All right, why don't we get started? Uh, there are a few announcements. This is the first center of that uh, since uh, winter break, believe it or not. We're starting a little bit later than normal, but we're going to have a very, very active semester. Uh, so the first thing I want to talk about is uh, a couple of programs that the center has. Uh, one of the programs that we have is specifically here for students at UMD. It is the Undergraduate Scholar Program. Uh, the Undergraduate Scholar Program specifically is a sort of enhancement in which uh, we try to provide some extra advising to students, but moreover the goal here is, is to provide extra interaction with various sort of speakers that come for center events. Uh, and better yet, you know, as the future progresses, you know, there may be opportunity we can better support your scholarship, uh, financially speaking. Uh, but we'll see. Uh, I'd like you to uh, check it out if you get the chance uh, on the center's website. Um, and if you had to discuss it with me, I, I'm the director of the center as well. Uh, also, I would like to point out that, oops, went wrong way. Uh, the center, of course, uh, runs primarily on external funds. Uh, we are starting a fund drive as well, uh, both to help the center scholars that we pick up, right, but also to bring in great speakers such as Professor Long over there. Uh, and. Uh, Today's lecture in particular is sponsored primarily by IHF, which is the Institute for Humane Studies. There is their webpage there. Um, any means you, I would suggest, especially if you're a student here seeking out their website, they have great information and they're really great with students in helping them get through graduate school. Uh, and if you can't find information through me, here's their website, which is at um, theihs.org. Right? Um, also, what's going to happen here after the presentation today, specifically the q and I'll be sending around a survey, right? The survey, two sides. Uh, there is an incentive if you fill out the survey, if you have a legitimate email address and you're a student, right? You're entered in for a chance for a $25 Amazon card. There you are. Uh, but also IHS will give you various sorts of info on their programming, right, and their various opportunities. So this will be coming around towards the end of the talk, so just be aware of it. Um, also, I'd like to mention an event that the center is partly involved with as well, but is also basically, how would you say, an event with many hands. There are many great departments, uh, including UMD's African American Studies, uh, the Philosophy Department, Genocide Studies, the English Department, right, Social Anthropology and Criminology Department. Uh, and what the actual event is, and it's hard for me to even fit it all on the screen, right, uh, is the Throwaways, which is a film uh, that we will be giving a viewing of. Uh, on top of the viewing, we'll also have a Q&A with uh, the creators of that film. Um, that's happening March 9th in Bohannon 90 uh, at 7 p.m. And it looks like it's going to be an, an excellent event. Uh, so I definitely encourage you guys to come to that as well. Uh, also, this particular series that we're talking about today, which is the Ethics of the Market, this series is an ongoing series throughout the center, uh, sponsored both by uh, IHS, the Institute for Humane Studies, and the Charles Koch Foundation. This particular talk today is primarily focused by IHS. Uh, the next talk will be Lauren Lemaski, which will be coming on the 27th of March, so literally a month from today. Uh, it'll be in the same room. Uh, that one's primarily funded by the Charles Koch Foundation. Lauren Lemaski, uh, some of you may know, uh, probably most because of your age don't know, uh, he used to be a faculty member here as well. Uh, so Lauren will be coming back home in a sense to give us a talk. And Lauren is very, very colorful and fun. Uh, so, and he talks like this. No, he does. He totally <laughs> talks like that. <laughs> so without further ado, uh, I'd like to thank uh, Professor Long, Roderick Long, uh, for coming here. He is a professor at Auburn University. Uh, I am not, and this is why I put this up here, because he thought I was going to memorize this whole thing. So, there are literally so many things that he has had his hands in that we wouldn't have time to go through it all, right? See? Uh, yes, and it is quite impressive. So, I had no problem in trying to figure out who I should bring to this series to, of course, send out an invite uh, to Professor Long, and graciously he accepted. Uh, very fun, very entertaining, and very quick. So I will turn it over to you, and I will put up your glorious PowerPoint. Those aren't my kids. <laughs> <laughs> I said the same thing, but my wife denies it. Apparently. <laughs> 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 
TMI, man. Yeah. <laughs> I don't think I'm going to need this. Unless I suddenly go faint during the presentation. Okay, so uh, I'm here to talk about uh, connections between, or indeed fusion between, uh, two positions that are usually not thought of as being at all friendly to each other, namely free market libertarianism and the radical left. There we go. So uh, you know, there's uh, images of uh, uh, one versus the other. Uh, on the, you know, the left side, we have the, uh, uh, you know, the tyrannical capitalist who is being uh, dragged down. Uh, on the right side, we have the heroic capitalist who is holding up a very large gear. Um, uh, um, so it uh, seems like we usually don't have that much in common. Uh, when I talk about the radical left, I'm not talking about these guys. Uh, I'm not talking about sort of the mainstream central, center left uh, uh, you know, folks in, uh, in political office. I have it by the radical left, I mean more people like these. Uh, so, um, if you don't recognize them, that's uh, David Graeber, Judith Butler, Noam Chomsky, and Howard Zinn. Um, so, people like that uh, are what I have in mind when I talk about the radical left. Um, yeah. These are people who tend to dislike free market libertarians as much as free market libertarians usually tend to dislike them. Um, you know, so, I am uh, you know, trying to arrange a matchmaking. Uh, uh, under rather challenging circumstances. Uh, now, of course, when I distinguish the you know the radical left from you know the first group I pointed to, uh, of course there is some overlap. There are lots of people who, you know, as I say, will read Chomsky and vote for Obama, just like on the other side the people who read you know Hayek and vote for Bush. So um, you know the boundaries can be a little bit uh, blurry, but still that's you know, that's what I have in mind. Uh, so, first of all, what's free market libertarianism? Very briefly, uh, it's the idea that you have the right to dispose of your own life and your own property without government interference, so long as you respect others' rights to do likewise. And this is usually given two different foundations. Different free market libertarians disagree as to which of these foundations they think is more fundamental, uh, or whether they think that uh, one of them is more fundamental than the other or not. So first is the idea of self-ownership, that uh, you are you know, the proper owner of your own life. And really, um, you know, more, more fundamentally, the idea is that no one else owns you, that no one else has the right to control you as long as you behave peacefully. You have the right to make your own choices. And this includes the right to control the product of your labor. Uh, on, the, um, on, the, uh, on the economic side, the usual argument is that uh, markets, private property, free exchange, have both incentival and informational advantages over government decision making. So incentival meaning that uh, under a market, you, you know, you, to the extent that you have a free market, people are able to make money only to the extent that they're producing stuff that other people want and are willing to uh, pay for, whereas you know, governments you know, have um, uh, aren't restricted by the market in that way. They, you know, once they're in power, they can produce stuff even if nobody uh, wants it. And also, they have, given that their power doesn't rest on pleasing the customer, they might have, have more incentive for uh, abusing that power. Uh, then, informationally, the idea is that competition is better than monopoly for information. That if you want to understand the best way to do something, allowing different ways of doing things to compete with each other, produces information, whereas when you have you know, a single group at the top making decisions for an entire society, it's very hard to tell whether they're making the right decisions or not because it's nothing to compare it to. So those two lines of argument, the superior to free markets on an economic basis, and the idea of your right to control yourself, your own life, your right to not to belong to other people or, or to be conscripted into other people's projects, to uh, 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 I think borrow a phrase from Lauren Lemaski. Um, uh, you know, those are the you know, sort of two of the foundations of free market libertarianism. Uh, um, now, 
when we're talking about the radical left, we're talking about people who are concerned about domination, exclusion, inequality, oppression, exploitation, hierarchy, environmental degradation. Those are just examples of some of the things that people associated with the radical left see themselves as uh, fighting against. And they see capitalist society in particular as pervaded by hierarchies, power hierarchies that are based on things like gender, race, class, uh, and so forth in ways that <coughs> oppress and constrain uh, people's lives. Now, as I said before, each of these people uh, tends to be suspicious of or hostile toward the other. There is some overlap between them. Um, people, you know, both free market libertarians and radical leftists, for example, tend to be anti-war, although I can think of exceptions on both sides, but by and large, uh, that's the case. Um, you know, they also tend you know, to be suspicious of you know, various kinds of government regulations of people's uh, social lives, tend to be suspicious of you know, things like uh, the war on drugs. Uh, and so forth. But uh, the reasons are often not the same, and the more specific applications they draw are often different, and then there are other issues on which they are you know, quite different indeed. In particular, radical leftists tend to see free market libertarians as defenders of the rich, uh, defenders of the privilege of the property classes. So, uh, and it often is going to look as though free market libertarians are going to permit what radical leftists would forbid, and the radical leftists are going to permit what free market libertarians are going to forbid. Uh, because it looks as though, uh, given the free market view, that you're free to do whatever you want with your own life and your property, as long as you don't violate anyone else's right to their life and property. It seems as though libertarianism is going to allow socioeconomic inequality, discrimination, hierarchical workplaces, environmental damage of various kinds, all these things it seems, as long as they're done in ways that don't violate the narrowly defined libertarian rights to person and property, it seems as though libertarians can say all those things are, are fine and dandy. Whereas the radical leftist thinks those are the various things that need to be combated. Uh, likewise, the radical leftist uh, seems to be committed to allowing coercive interference with people's choices about their own lives and property, if doing that is necessary to combat those things. And the free market libertarian wants to forbid it. So this is why these guys seem to be uh, necessarily opposed. But this hasn't always been the case. In the 19th century, in particular with the 19th century individualist anarchists, and on the screen here I've got uh, Lysander Spooner, Henry David Thoreau, Voltaire de Clare, and Benjamin Tucker. Uh, this is an example of uh, some of the major ones. Uh, in the 19th century, it was very common for these perspectives to be combined. There were people who were strong defenders of free markets and private property, and also regarded themselves as champions of uh, the working class against capitalist power. They called themselves anti-capitalists. Sometimes they called themselves socialists, although what they meant by socialism was something like worker control of industry, but not necessarily in a collective way, and certainly not in a uh, governmental way. And they were also in the forefronts of the fight, uh, fight for feminism and fight against slavery and so forth. Um, so and, you know, radical leftists and free market libertarians can both look to these, these people as kind of forerunners. But how is it that these ideas you know, that were combined in them are separated now, um, and is that, you know, is that the right thing to do? Well, radical leftists and free market libertarians have some common roots. Yeah, there are some common principles that unite them, even if they tend to interpret these principles differently. One is the idea of equality of authority. The idea that no one inherently has any more legitimate authority than anyone else. That no one really inherently has the right to tell other people what to do, uh, to claim uh, uh, you know, some kind of power other people uh, aren't allowed access to. Uh, as I said, uh, no, libertarians tend to think that this is a reason to, for suspicion against government regulations, since government regulations seem to be some people, the government, and those who are supporting it, claiming some right to make decisions that some other people don't have the right to. Um, uh, whereas radical leftists tend to see it in terms of things like socioeconomic inequality as giving the richer kind of authority, 
that those don't have. Likewise, the devotion of opposition to privilege is something in common between libertarians and radical leftists, even though they don't necessarily interpret it the same way. Um, libertarians tend to focus on you know, governmental privilege. Uh, radical leftists, although they sometimes are concerned with that, have a much broader concern with the private forms of privilege. Now, since the 19th century, since these two strands sort of separated, since then, libertarians have sort of specialized in studying forms of oppression that are directly governmental. And the radical leftists have sort of specialized in studying forms that aren't. Uh, so I think that the possibility of this division of labor on each side is something to learn from the other. Uh, each one can be, in some sense, the national, natural completion of the other. Uh, choosing this picture is dangerous because it makes it look as though you know, one of them is the big one and the other is the little one that's going to be absorbed by the big one. And that isn't exactly what I intended, but it was the best two things being natural completion of each other picture I could find. Um, uh, so what I want to say is that those who value radical leftist ends have a reason to care about free market libertarian means. Because the chief, though not the sole enabler of the evils that the radical leftist is fighting against, is not the market but the state. Uh, so I want to say that the radical leftist has in many cases misidentified the chief cause of the problems that it's concerned with. That uh, the state is actually what uh, is causing, uh, uh, or at least playing a crucial role in, in causing uh, these things. Likewise, those who value free market libertarian re means have a reason to care about radical leftist ends. Because you know, libertarians will often say, well, it's wrong to push people around in ways that violate their libertarian rights in this narrowly construed way. But if you push people around in ways that aren't rights violations, then you know, libertarians per se have no reason to care about that. Um, but I think that's wrong. I think that it would be weird if it's wrong to push people around by force, but it's not wrong to push people around or manipulate them in other ways. It seems like there'd be, those would be wrong for some of the same reasons. That's not necessarily exactly the same reasons. Maybe the response to, to them might not be exactly the same. Um, you know, it might, it might be right that, you know, that oppression that involves force should be fought by force, but oppression that doesn't involve force should be fought by other means. But nevertheless, it's important to see that you know, libertarians ought to care about this stuff. Uh, this brings me to the notion of thick libertarianism, which is an idea that uh, I think I got from Charles Johnson, but he thinks he got it from me. So, um, But the basic terminology, I think, you know, he's developed anyway. Um, this is the idea that libertarians as libertarians have reason to, to uh, value certain things and uh, to accept certain value commitments, even if those aren't directly entailed by this libertarian non-aggression principle, the principle that forbids aggression against other people's person and property. Um, you know, so it's not just that these other things are worth fighting for additional reasons. So in addition to being a libertarian, you should be this other thing too, but that uh, there are both causal and conceptual links between libertarianism and these other things in such a way that being a libertarian means you ought to care about this other stuff. So, uh, Charles draws four main categories here. So this is what he calls grounds thickness, which is the idea that there might be some commitments that are not entailed by the libertarian non-aggression principle, but nevertheless are entailed by the best reasons for that principle. So for example, he thinks that a general kind of anti-authoritarianism it's concerned not just with governmental authority or with you know, forcible authority, but with authority in general, that that's part of the best reason for accepting the non-aggression principle. It's not the whole story, but it's an important part of it. And therefore, it's reasonable for libertarians to be suspicious of authoritarianism you know, in the workplace or in relations between the sexes and so forth, even in cases where these don't involve anything governmental. Um, then there's application thickness, which is the idea that there are values that are not directly entailed by the non-aggression principle, but which you need in order to be able to apply it. Uh, yeah. So for example, uh, if you believe in libertarian rights, who has those rights? Is it just humans, or does it include animals? Um, if it's humans, is it all humans? Does it include you know, severely mentally disabled humans, or not? Well, the non-aggression principle just sits there not telling you. You're going to need some, in order to figure out how to apply it to particular cases, you're going to need some other values uh, you know, to determine what, uh, 
the right story is there. So those are sort of you know, conceptual connections between libertarianism and other values. There are also sort of causal connections. So for example, libertarians often say, why should we care about gross economic inequality? Well, the answer might be that in a society characterized by gross economic inequality, uh, libertarianism might be very difficult to maintain because the, you know, the wealthy will be in a position to translate their wealth into political power and they might uh, uh, do that. And so there's some reason for libertarians to be worried. Uh, likewise, there are some things you know, that a libertarian might have reason to oppose because they're independently bad, but they're also indirectly caused by um, violations of libertarian rights. So you often find libertarians defending sweatshops on the grounds that uh, the sweatshop is the best available uh, option for many poor people. And so if you close that option off, you make that the person worse off. Which I think is true as far as it goes. I mean, if the, you know, if the, if the choice is between, you know, they're being employed in a sweatshop and they're not being able to eat at all, sure, the sweatshop is better. But I think that it's an inadequate uh, analysis. You have to ask the question, why is it that these people are in the position such that the sweatshop is their best available option? And if you look at the background of that, you're often going to find systematic dispossession of people from the traditional lands uh, uh, the, as a result of various kinds of government action. So that, um, you know, so that you know, new governments come along and you know, so that, you know, this is something that's true like throughout Africa and Latin America and places like that, that um, you know, governments have thrown people off their traditional land. So now they're, you know, people no longer have their, you know, where they used to live. They have to go to work for, you know, you know, the big corporations have sort of come there and set up a sweatshop, and just saying, yay, sweatshops, free market, is sort of you know, ignoring the context there. Uh, so the idea of thick libertarianism is that libertarians should see their struggle against the state as united together with these, uh, with these other struggles, struggles against patriarchy, struggles against bosses, and, and so forth. And this was, in fact, the, um, the uh, legacy of the 19th century uh, libertarians. Uh, so there's this idea of free market anti-capitalism. Now people often use free market and capitalism as synonyms. And so the notion of free market anti-capitalism may be striking. This particular phrase, free market anti-capitalism, was coined by Kevin Carson. But if you go back to the 19th century, you find you know, those people I was talking about call themselves anti-capitalist, but they use the term free market positively. Defenders and opponents of modern capitalism often seem to assume that our society is approximately a free market. You know, often hear people talking about our free market you know, society. And they also tend to assume that uh, you know, any socioeconomic inequality or corporate power that exists in our society is the result of that uh, free market. Whereas the free market anti-capitalist view is that in fact our society is a corporatist one. One dominated by a, a kind of partnership between big government and big business and that it's a mistake to conflate that with a free market. So this conflating mistake comes in two forms. So left conflationism is basically saying you know, capitalism equals free market, capitalism bad, therefore free market bad. You know, taking the evils of present day big business, big government, dominated system and saying, well, look at all these bad results. That's the free market. So we should be against free market. The right conflationist takes the reverse view. Says, you know, comes up with these theoretical virtues of the free market and then says, well, in this existing system we have now is a free market, so we should defend that. Uh, so people on the left will often do the, the, fir the first one. People on the right, conservatives, but also many libertarians will often tend to do the second. Now, traditionally, the word capitalism meant a system favoring capitalists over workers. That's where the term uh, originates. So uh, you know, it seems like a bad term to use for someone who doesn't you know, see themselves as defending you know, the employing class against the working class. Uh, moreover, the way the term is used now, it used to mean something like the free market system we have today. And if you don't think that the system we have today is a free market, then the free market system we have today is a non-referring phrase. It doesn't refer to anything. It's like um, uh, that, um, 
by use some term that meant uh, a giant metallic sphere like the Washington Monument. Um, you know, I, I've built in a definition and an example, but the example doesn't fit the definition. You know, so like with, by capitalism, I mean a free market society like our present one, you know, if I think that those doesn't fit, then that you know, doesn't really refer to anything. Uh, and so uh, this is the reason that libertarians shouldn't, uh, shouldn't use the term <coughs> capitalism to refer to a free market. Is free market anti-capitalism the same as bleeding heart libertarianism? Uh, there's a blog called Bleeding Heart Libertarians. Uh, I'm part of it. Uh, is it the same thing? Well, yes and no. Uh, Bleeding Heart Libertarianism is supposed to mean the combination of the social justice concerns of the left with the free market concerns of libertarianism. So in that sense, what I'm arguing for is a form of Bleeding Heart Libertarianism. That's why I'm on that blog. Um, but uh, most of the members of that blog, I'll go back then, you know, everyone on it but Gary Chartier and myself, uh, are, from my point of view, tend to see the libertarian commitments and the leftist commitments as moderating each other. Um, you know, the, they're using the liber their libertarian side to temper their leftist side, using their leftist side to temper uh, the libertarian side. Mm -hmm. Uh, thus ending up with a fairly moderate form of libertarianism and a fairly moderate form of leftism. Uh, so for example, a lot of people, all, a lot of call themselves bleeding heart libertarians, favor a government guaranteed minimum income, uh, you know, which is you know, a departure from strict libertarianism, which would say, well, it's a violation of property rights. Also, it, you know, it assumes that markets are needed for that. It assumes that you don't, uh, you know, that the effects of state power aren't dangerous enough uh, to counteract that. On the other hand, many free market, any, many uh, bleeding heart libertarians also will be defending sweatshops, which I think is you know, sort of watering down their, you know, their leftist credentials. Uh, whereas you know, the position I defend sees the leftism and the libertarianism as reinforcing each other. That you know, the leftism make, should make the libertarian side more radically libertarian, and the, and the libertarian side should make the leftist side more radically leftist. So, Big business, as many libertarians often think of it, this is a scene from Atlas Shrugged. This is the, you know, the two heroic uh, entrepreneurs uh, of, uh, of that story. Um, you know, each is sort of a captain of industry uh, with you know, creative genius and foresight, giving orders to lots of you know, less smart people uh, below and doing heroic things and the government's trying to stop them. And you know, a lot of libertarians, their image of big business is sort of shaped by it. Uh, this sort of picture. On the other hand, in ordinary life, people, you know, Dilbert is a better description than Atlas Shrugged is of what the business world in the corporate world seem like to most people who have to uh, interact with it. Uh, you get these sort of systematic uh, irrationalities, you get hierarchies where the boss really doesn't, you know, the boss is not Hank Reardon or Dagny Taggart, the boss is some pointy haired uh, yeah, idiot who doesn't really know what's going on and uh, the people farther, who, farther down who actually do know what's going on can't really convince the boss of anything. So, you know, uh, you know, how do you reconcile this you know, vision of what the business is actually like with this, you know, with this uh, you know, libertarian ideal of it? Uh, there is uh, a dynamic I like to call right cop, left cop, which is sort of you know, inspired by the idea of good cop, bad cop which is where uh, conservatives will come across as critics of big government, and liberals will come across as critics of big business. And when conservatives are defending big business, they do it as sort of a defense against big government, and liberals will defend big government as a defense against big business. But you know, if you think that, in fact, big government and big business are mostly cooperating, <coughs> Um, not in everything, you know, in any partnership, each one would kind of like to be the dominant partner, so there's some pushing and shoving with each other. But if you see big business and big government as more cooperating than competing, then uh, you know, there's going to be something uh, disturbing about a, you know, a political system that asks us to choose between being for big business or being for big government, you know, being for the, you know, the left wing of the ruling class or the right wing of the ruling class. And the result is that, you know, if 
you, know, you look at the results of big business, you don't like those, you'll sort of get lured into supporting big government. You look at the results of big government, you don't like those, you get lured into supporting big business. And genuine alternative is sort of rendered uh, invisible. So I like to use uh, you know, the Star Wars prequels are, are good for something. They are good for this example. Um, so, you know, in the Star Wars prequels, you've got you know, Palpatine representing the government. He's the head of the Senate. On the one, other hand, you've got um, uh, Count Dooku representing the uh, industrial interests, the, uh, the bankers, the merchant cl uh, clans, and so forth. Obviously, that's the capitalist guy. They are uh, you know, supposedly fighting each other, but we find out they're actually uh, working together, and people are sort of being lured and supporting one uh, over the other. Now, just as in real life, so in the Star Wars prequels, it's not an entirely happy partnership. Each side wants to be the dominant partner. You know, Palpatine wants to dominate Dooku, Dooku wants to overthrow Palpatine. Each one is trying to engage people to help him do that. But nevertheless, they are clearly more cooperating than competing. And on the view that I'm defending, that same is true of big business and big government as well. It's not always so directly and explicitly conspiratorial. Uh, often it's just the fact that their interests align in certain ways means they don't necessarily have to get together and, you know, and hatch evil plans, although you know, that sometimes happens, but um, it's not really necessary. The way the system is set up, they will tend uh, to align in their interests. So on this view, on the free market anti-capitalist view, markets are a leveling force. Because if you're free to, if someone does something that makes them very successful and they get a lot of money from it, then if other people are free to compete with them, they will. They'll imitate them. If you can imitate people who are doing something that makes them successful, then you'll ordinarily be successful too. Um, and thus, it'll be hard for them to maintain that kind of level of income so long as people are free to compete with them. And therefore, when you see really dramatic inequalities of wealth, that's usually going to be a sign that some kind of interference with the free market is going on. Um, and in fact, government regulations, including ones that are usually thought to be defending people against big business, uh, actually tend to have the result of insulating dominant firms from market feedback. Um, so on this view, competition would actually make firms uh, smaller, less hierarchical. Um, there'd be more workers cooperatives, more independent contractors. And where you do have an employer-employee situation, employees would have more control over their conditions of employment because there would be you know, more attractive alternatives, and so you'd have to uh, you know, have to treat them in a less crappy way in order to get them to stay. Now, the notion of class struggle was actually developed before Marx by libertarians, a uh, uh, version of it by early French liberals like Charles Comte and Charles Dunoyer and Augustin Thierry, and then you know, in a more thoroughgoing form by someone like Thomas Hodgkin um, in England. And unlike Marx, who treats differential access to the means of production as the cause of differential access to state privilege. The libertarian version tends to see it as the effect. In other words, the way you get some classes having a kind of monopoly control over resources is mostly, not entirely, but mostly as a result of systematic government intervention. And so the libertarian's defense of private property doesn't necessarily mean you defend existing property arrangements if those are the result of something that's not so libertarian. So for example, people often say, well, the reason that you get these large firms in a market is because of economies of scale. It's more, you know, a larger firm can do something more efficiently than a smaller firm can. If you've got you know, two firms, if you merge the two firms together, the whole thing will be, will be more than just twice as efficient as the two were individually. Well, that's often true, but there are limits to it. Um, you know, otherwise, you know, if, if, if bigger firms uh, you know, merging together makes, you know, it makes for greater efficiency, then why not merge all the firms in the economy into one big firm? I suppose it would be called Disney. But this you know, <laughs> big firm that you would just, that would just, just a single firm providing everything from shoes to software to hot dogs uh, to cars to insurance policy, just all by one big firm. Well, that is the socialist central planning, right? It would just be one, uh, you know, how would that be different from, from socialist central planning? You think social, social central planning is inefficient because you don't have the competition 
that gives people you know, knowledge and information, then you know, this wouldn't be either. So as firms get larger, they, you know, more and more internally they're, they're insulated from the feedback of competition and the price system. And so and as it get more hierarchical, there's a problem with knowledge and hierarchies. Knowledge doesn't travel very well up hierarchies. Um, you know, partly because you know, people are always afraid to tell the boss exactly the truth because you're afraid to tell the truth to someone who's actually in a position to zap you. Um, and as these firms get bigger and more complex, they get more inefficient, and so there would be a limit. You know, at some point, diseconomies of scale overtake economies of scale, so there will be a natural limit to how large these firms can grow, unless there's some way in which they're growing beyond that point, can some will be subsidized. Now, so if there's some way in which uh, the government can enable a firm to socialize, externalize onto the rest of society, the costs of getting bigger, while still pocketing for itself the benefits, then the firms will get bigger than they otherwise would. So, subsidies, government gives lots of subsidies to you know, make agribusiness concerns and things like that, bailouts, protectionist tariffs that you know, protect companies from competition from overseas, eminent domain where the government will just seize private land and you know, often will just give it to some corporation on the grounds that the corporation using it will create more public benefit for the society and so it's a public use. Um, then all the licensing and zoning and regulatory hoops that are easier for big established firms to jump through than they are for you know, small, poorer firms. All those, uh, you know, those hoops uh, you know, just make it so that you know, the bigger firms jump, jump through them easily. You know, smaller businesses sort of clamber awkwardly through them. And then if you're just like a you know, little individual group, you might just not even try. It's just too difficult. Um, also, even though increased firm size can create more productivity, the result is you're going to have to distribute your products over a wider area because you know, the local market may be saturated. So if you're producing more stuff, you have to distribute farther, which means your distribution costs, your cost of transporting the stuff has gone up. But you know, notice the fact that we have tax-funded highways. Um, and most of the wear and tear on highways is done by these big shipping companies with their big trucks. But they don't, prepare, they don't pay a proportional share of taxes for them. So in effect, the rest of us are subsidizing the uh, big shipping companies. Thus, they are, we're, you know, we are paying a portion of their distribution costs and thus enabling them to make a larger firm size more practical than it would otherwise be. Also, Transactions between firms get taxed, sales tax. Transactions within firms don't, as a rule. And therefore, you know, uh, you have a reason, it gives firms a reason to move more functions in-house. You know, if, I, if, I, if I'm a firm and I have a bunch of copying to do, I take it down to the local copy shop to copy it, I have to pay them sales tax. If we just have a copying division within the firm, don't have to pay sales tax on that. So this is an incentive to move more and more stuff uh, in-house. And of course, smaller firms are less able to do that. Also, uh, you know, when you expand the money supply, the money supply doesn't ex you know, expand everywhere instantly at once. Um, as the money supply expands, of course, the value of any individual dollar falls, but not all at once. So the, the first the firms that get, you know, that get loans from big banks, they get the money first who are still facing the old prices. By the time the money trickles down to the poor, they start facing the new higher prices while they've still got the old, you know, the, the old money, it's a smaller amount of money, and as a result, the, you know, the rich systematically benefit. Also, here's something that looks, you know, looks benign, quality standards. Standards that say that you know, goods have to be of a certain quality. But of course, this, this means that there's one dimension that businesses are freed from competing on, which is quality, and it means that if you are you know, that firms that want to provide lower quality goods at a lower price get priced out of the market and you know, thus enabling the, the larger firms to uh, maintain things. Likewise, copyrights and patents. Remember when I said that, uh, that, um, but that it's hard to stay, you know, to stay really rich in a free market because uh, whatever you're doing, other people can imitate it. Well, copyrights and patents are basically laws against imitating other people's success. Um, uh, and um, you know, 
thus in effect, uh, well, Disney. Um, you know, the deposit insurance uh, encourages banks to make uh, risky investments because they know that they'll get reimbursed. Uh, if you have a liability cap, and you're, you know, if there's a limit to how much liability you can have, then you're more likely to, risk to drill in risky ways, you know, deep water horizon. Um, uh, Republicans are all screaming about Obamacare as if it were socialism, but you know the individual mandate is basically you're forced to buy insurance from insurance companies. This is actually a giveaway uh, to insurance companies. Um, then you know, there are large portions of of land ownership um, you know that are not acquired in the libertarian way, which is by you know mixing your labor with uh, natural resources or purchasing assistance from someone who did. You have a you know, vast percentage of the United States, especially west of the Mississippi. Most of the land is owned either by the federal government or by state governments. Um, and the land that is it, privately held was not acquired, uh, a lot of it wasn't acquired by homesteading, it was acquired by government fiat. There's lots of land that's never been developed and no labor has been mixed with it, seriously. But just, you know, just the state said, you, you know, Las Vegas, insurance, Las Vegas Land Company, you get to just have all this land. Uh, likewise, the bigger a firm is, the harder a time it has determining the value of individual employees. Now, uh, you know, in a free market, there's some incentive not to discriminate in hiring because you penalize yourself by hiring, you know, by if you hire on the basis of uh, discrimination rather than the basis of who has the best, uh, you know, the best talent, uh, you, you hurt your bottom line. But in cases where it's really hard for people to determine what the contribution of any given employee is, which is harder for the bigger the firm is, then people will have it harder for their prejudices to be corrected. That uh, it becomes uh, just easier and natural uh, to discriminate in ways that you, you, you've just internalized and you don't get any market correction for that. Uh, likewise, labor laws. Now, lots of libertarians are just very anti-union. But, you know, from the perspective I'm talking about, that's a mistake. Unions are more the victims than the perpetrators in the system. Labor laws have sort of co-opted them into a kind of ju being a junior partner of the big government, big business uh, uh, partnership. Um, unions aren't really sort of, you know, are penalized if they try to, to bypass that. You get lots of interesting, lately successful cases uh, uh, like the, um, the Imakali uh, uh, union, which just which just bypassed all the official government union regulation and just went you know, directly through strikes and uh, you know, had a lot of success. But uh, there are lots of labor regulations that try to discourage that kind of thing. Uh, then there are, you know, there are all kinds of restrictions on mutual aid, all kinds of restrictions on starting a small firm. Um, uh, plus the fact that so many resources are kept out of you know of access by you know, by various kinds of government regulations means that people are forced to work for employers. So let's just talk about wage slavery. And the attorneys often say, well, you know, yeah, that's an exaggeration. You're not forced to work for them. It's a voluntary transaction. Mm -hmm. But if the uh, if it's become prohibitively costly for people to start their own businesses or for workers to start their own co-ops or whatever. So if their only options were for someone, then you know, wage slavery is, you know, it's kind of a, a, a point that you are forced to work for other people. And this isn't just a feature of the free market, this is a feature of systematic governmental intervention. All right, so if any of this is right, what do we do about it? Uh, well, the people who rule the society are a minority. Uh, they are outnumbered by those they rule. There's an interesting moral to this, which is the ruling class, you know, the big business, big government hierarchy, likes to claim that they are the sources of social order. They are what we need. They are what keep social order going. But the weird thing is that they are vastly outnumbered by the rest of us. How is a small group of people vastly outnumbered in strength and power by everyone else, how are they able to keep us, you know, keep us all orderly? I mean, if they had the powers of the Justice League or something, I could understand it. You know, I could see how, uh, you know, Superman and Wonder Woman could keep a lot of us in line. But they're just, you know, ordinary humans. 
Um, it seems as though the reason they have the kind of power that they do is because people go along with it. Which means that so did popular acquiescence is the source of their power. This popular acquiescence is also the source of the social order. They don't produce the social order. Uh, we do. And thus, you know, the good news is you don't need the state and its various you know, plutocratic dependents uh, to maintain social order. You can have uh, a viable stateless society. It also means that you don't have to get that result through the state. A lot of people think that the way to achieve uh, uh, a better society is either by petitioning the state, asking it to change what it's doing, or to get control of it. You know, whether you can control of it by having a violent revolution and seizing it, or whether you get control of it by trying to get people elected. Um, and of course, those are you know, those are the kinds of things where you have to have a critical mass to make any relevant difference. Um, they're really difficult, but maybe that's not necessary. Uh, maybe a different approach is through education, through direct bottom-up grassroots action, by building alternative institutions to bypass the state. Uh, these are cases where you don't have to convince 51% of the population to do something. You just start building alternative institutions, gradually winning people's affiliation to those, and away from the state until such a end, the state and its, you know, its corporate buddies, until you get to the point where they're, you know, they're just sort of disempowered. And there's a wonderful uh, Monty Python sketch of Adolf Hitler coming, uh, you know, coming to 1970s England. And he's giving the same kind of speeches he gave before. And he's standing on the balcony ranting. And you pull back and there are like three people standing at him looking at him puzzled. Um, well, you know, that's what the rulers are without our cooperation. Just at some point you withdraw enough uh, support from them, and they're just some guys saying stuff. <laughs> uh, so this, this cartoon is supposed to illustrate uh, the idea that the uh, rulers depend uh, on the acquiescence of the ruled, and that you actually you know, the guy's walking away is actually doing more to undermine the ruler than the guy, people who are standing there telling him what to do with their signs. Okay, so where to learn more? Here are some of the organizations that I'm associated with. There's the Alliance of the Libertarian Left. Uh, there's its website. Um, then there's the Molinari Institute. Uh, it's one of our publications on the right. The one on the left isn't actually our publication, but it's a bunch of us in it. Um, uh, these are websites of, of uh, several people associated with our gang. Um, and then Center for Stateless Society and Students for Stateless Society are, are, are um, uh, probably our, our most vocal uh, out at the moment. And that's that. Questions? Yes, I'll move back. So, um, I knew from some of your papers, and it seems that, like, although you're advocating like various anarcho markets, that you also kind of touch upon the necessity of having crash protection agencies. But I have to wonder if it's actually necessary to reach a sort of true libertarian socialist like, society that you can advocate for. And then, in addition to that, like, what would prevent those agencies from, like, Okay, so um, first question uh, is, is a society like this going to have private protection agencies and is that, you know, is that necessary, is that desirable? Um, well, it depends. Private protection agencies are one way of, uh, of protecting rights without the state. So the idea is that you would, you know, you'd sign up with some, with some organization that, um, you know, that will you know, offer you some kind of rights protection. You know, it might be one, uh, one that would do like these police patrols of your neighborhood. It might be another one that would provide the you know, arbitration services. It doesn't have to all be the same organization, though it might be. Um, and you can have different ones competing. Uh, that's one way of doing things. That's the way most free market anarchists uh, defend that view. It's not the only way of doing it. You could have you know, more sort of um, neighborhood collective things. You could have sort of a whole neighborhood that's has a kind of mutual neighborhood watch, rather than delegating it to a specific you know, agency, you could, uh, you, know, you could just have the whole community go in on it together. 
That's another possibility. There are different ways things can go. Um, however, uh, talk about the protected agencies, the second question is, is there a reason to think that they might start abusing power? Uh, you know, what stops them? Well, the idea is that there, it could be harder for them to abuse power if there's competition in free energy. Um, now, it's not impossible, and that's why I think having a background of sort of social vigilance is a good thing. You don't want to just delegate all of this to the agencies. But on the other hand, the division of labor is a good thing too. It's kind of a trade-off. Uh, but uh, one advantage of these uh, you know, of private protection agencies is that even people who are very bigoted and would like to pass all kinds of nasty regulations might be deterred. Some of them, not all of them, most extreme ones will, but a lot of the average ones will be deterred by having to pay extra for them. So suppose that you get your, you know, your monthly premium from your protection agency, and you see that, you know, it's a, you know, x amount of, uh, you know, a lot of money you're paying to protect you against, against uh, assault and theft and so forth, and then you see, you know, the additional amount you're paying to, um, uh, to have. Um, uh, your agency sort of snooping in your in your neighbor through your neighbor's windows to see if they're having sex with the wrong people or smoking the wrong thing, and even if you really care a lot about what your neighbor is smoking or who they're having sex with, you know, some people will care enough that they'll pay extra for it. But the people who care, not everyone who cares enough to pull a lever in a voting machine will care enough to pay an extra amount every month. So that can make things a little more um, uh, push things to give people an economic incentive. Now, the, no. So the two worries we have about protecting agencies is one is that they might fight with each other, and the other is that they might not fight with each other. Uh, we might sort of combine into a state. Um, is either of those possible? Sure. Um, all we can talk about is sort of likelihood. But the, uh, the thing is that if they're not states yet, so they don't yet have a captive customer base, a monopoly over a particular group of customers, then since war is a more uh, expensive method of solving disputes than arbitration, um, you know, it's a lot easier to, to choose war over arbitration if you can externalize the costs. So governments can externalize the costs um, because they have a captive taxpayer base. Um, whereas you know, if your agency starts solving more of its, uh, its uh, disputes through war, you might just um, decide to switch to a cheaper one that prefers arbitration, uh, that'll be some check on them. Now it's not decisive. Uh, and non-state, non-monopoly agencies sometimes choose violent conflict? Sure, it's kind of a cultural thing, various things. Again, that's the reason why social vigilance is necessary in the background. Um, but I think that protected agencies have less of an incentive, given competition, have less of an incentive to choose war than governments do. Um, then there's the danger of collusion. Um, uh, that's certainly true. Brian Kaplan's written some interesting stuff about this. Uh, he talks about cases where, because the worry is, uh, would they become a monopoly by just simply refusing to let anyone new into any new agency for the network? Um, and he argues that this is going to be like a cartel situation. It's the interest of all the protection agencies to maintain the cartel collectively, but it's the interest of any individual one. Uh, cheat on it. So to the extent that they're driven by economic incentives, uh, cartels are hard to maintain. Now, when they're driven by other incentives besides cartels, when they're driven by you know, ideology or social pressure or something, that can make it easier to maintain them. Uh, again, that's why I think you do need social vigilance in the background, so I'm going to be partly agreeing with you. Yes? I have to, uh, two questions. One is the Going back to the very beginning about the foundations for libertarianism, the, there's a, a kind of a radical left tradition that's very skeptical about natural rights. And I'm thinking of Bentham and Marx who think this is ideology and mm -hmm. stilts. Whereas the libertarians seem to share in common with their conservat with conservatives, the moral conservatives, a focus on, on natural rights and the idea that there's some sort of a basis in the rights. So how can these two come together if they, if they tend to have such a big disagreement about the foundation? Well, I mean, there are, I think the, the, there is division on each side. I mean, there are, there are lots of libertarians who don't believe in natural rights. 
and there are a fair number of radical leftists you know, who do, in some sense. Um, you know, my own view is sort of a, a mix here too. I'm, um, uh, you know, so there's this big dispute among libertarians between those who want to base things mainly on economic consequences, consequentialist arguments, and those who want to base them on, on natural rights. Um, my, own, my own philosophical framework is more sort of an Aristotelian virtue approach, where I think that the content of one virtue informs the content of the other virtues. So I see the, the contents of the different virtues as sort of mutually determining. So uh, if you think of, of the virtue of justice as the one that's concerned with rights, um, and then you think of sort of concerned with consequences as you know, involving virtues like benevolence and prudence and so forth. My view is that uh, you can't fully settle the content of justice apart from prudence and benevolence and therefore apart from considerations of consequences. But it also works in the reverse way too. You can't fully settle what counts as a good consequence independent from sort of you know, uh, initial conceptions of justice. So I think these are different values that go. Um, that go together, but um, but you know the people that I'm talking about, the you know, people who are in the Center, Center for Stateless Society, have a wide variety of views about ethical foundations. Um, we've got one guy who uh, we call him an advocate of the Borg because his view is that um, that you know, for him, what you should maximize is 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 freedom and that this might involve eventually merging all human minds into a single gigantic computer mind. He's the only one of us who thinks that. Uh, and, he's, you know, and he's completely rejects any kind of natural rights. It's just, it's just all utilitarianism except the, the good to be promoted is freedom rather than, um, uh, than happiness. But we have natural rights here as utilitarians, um, uh, various things. So you can, you can have people disagree about the foundations and still you know, agree about things. Uh, you know, farther down the line. I mean, if we, you know, if we agree that it's, you know, that it's a good thing not to treat people like crap, the fact that we have different theoretical re reasons about why it's a good thing not to treat people like crap doesn't, you know, sometimes that those differences will come out in the applications, but they needn't always do so. Yes? I really like your slide where you showed the uh, the class on the Diamond board and everybody standing off. One guy leaving. I'd like to comment. And I learned from your presentation that both uh, libertarian uh, philosophy as well as anarchic philosophy might be that person who decided to step off the planet. And more and more that I didn't see or hear much with regards to that impetus can and should come more from labor because. Of the, not so much anti-capitalist, but the natural balance between capitalist and non-capitalist is what Abraham Lincoln pointed out is all capitals derived from labor. They've lost their way. Why, why isn't that a leader in that call to step off? Um, well, it is. And we still just call ourselves libertarians. Uh, and several of us are actually members of the IWW, although I'm not. But, um, yeah, so the... Uh, you know, the idea of um, uh, of a fusion of libertarianism with the movement you know, for labor empowerment, you know, is sort of a move back to the 19th century approach, and is something that we uh, we talk about. Uh, Kevin Carson has this really nice piece called "Labor Struggle: a Free Market Perspective," where um, uh, he talks about uh, you know, basically sort of IWW tactics as applied. You know, Free market tools against the capitalist class. Yes. Uh, I appreciate if you could comment on a little cognitive dissonance I'm having. We're in a public university, that's a state university. <laughs> I drove here on public roads, which were built by the state. The other cars were obeying the laws of the state, and I'm glad about that. Before I came, I had lunch eating publicly inspected and uh, food that was met public standards the state. This morning I took some medication that uh, was reviewed and approved by the state to be pure and uh, of good quality. I certainly object to the state's encroachment in many areas, but I also appreciate the role of the state. 
um, very broadly. My children go to public school. My grandchildren go to public school. I'm just curious as to where the outer limits of the acceptable state reside, because I certainly can't buy a stateless <coughs> society. That is to say, you used in one of your very final examples people doing grassroots movements. What is the net result of a grassroots movement? People cooperating and creating some rules under which they're going to agree to live, which is a state. So I'd be curious about that. About okay, well, imagine we're in ancient Rome, and um, you know, when we're you know, sitting in a nice uh, villa in the Mediterranean, and someone says to you, I feel like you're anti-slavery, and I really have a problem with that, because we're living in this beautiful building we're living in. It was built by slave labor. Look at the food that we're eating. It was, it was, it was grown by slaves, harvested by slaves, cooked by slaves. Uh, are you against food? Are you against farming? Are you against houses? How can you be anti-slavery? Um, because they, um, uh, the assumption was that the existing way of producing those things was the only or the natural or the obvious way of doing it. Um, so nowadays, because uh, state control you know, sort of is such a big part of our lives and has taken over so many aspects of life, we tend to think that anything that the, um, you know, that the state is currently doing is something that if you're against the state doing it, then you're against having that thing. If you're against the state providing education, then you're against education. If you're against the state providing roads, then you're against roads. But, you know, historically there have been you know, everything from private roads to private courts. Um, and they weren't always you know, paid to use roads either. Uh, in 19th century England, there were some roads that, that people built for free, not out of the goodness of their hearts, but because it raised the property values of their businesses to have you know, roads going by them and so forth. Uh, you know, so all the things we think of as, as public goods provided by the state, each of them has, at one point or another, been provided by, you know, by people interacting on a purely voluntary basis. Um, I think the idea that the end result of grassroots action you know, is some kind of state decision, um, I think historically what happens is this grassroots action and the state at first tries to resist it, then sees it's happening, so quickly runs out and puts itself in front of it. That happened with the civil rights movement, where you know, the early you know, wins for desegregation were done with you know, direct action on the ground, and then the state suddenly says, oh, well, we're the leader of this movement, and it sort of erases their past history and makes it sound as though they were sort of doing it from the start. Uh, so, uh, the, the fact that we that something is provided in a certain way now doesn't mean that that's the only way it can be provided. I like the question, too. <laughs> yes. Uh, I, uh, I really enjoy the talk a lot. I came prepared to do combat. <laughs> um, I wanted to pursue the uh, markets as leveling, because mm -hmm. that's one of the thoughts that sort of moves me. I've tended to look at it the other way, that markets sort of inherently tend toward oligarchy, oligopolies, or monopolies. And that has to do with the business cycle, and, and uh, tough times come, the smaller firms get squeezed out, the bigger firms claim the assets. And you talk a lot about the firms, but eventually it becomes just private held bundles of capital. And they, they, if a firm gets in trouble, well, they sell it off and buy something else. They buy whatever happens to be doing really good. So from that point of view, there's an inherent tendency for, for, for free markets to sort of tend toward uh, central, central <coughs> power, authority, and dominance. Would you just talk about Okay, so on the, um, on the issue of the business cycle, I mean, the, um, the libertarian analysis is the, the main cause of the business cycle is various kinds of government uh, intervention, in particular monetary uh, intervention, where, um, uh, so uh, essentially, uh, the idea is something like this, that uh, interest rates are a, are a signal of uh, how willing uh, you know, lenders are to defer present consumption, um, or how willing or able they are. Uh, when government manipulates interest rates, it often gives producers the impression that uh, 
that people are more willing to defer consumption or more able to defer consumption than they are, and this gives the impression that there are more goods available for longer term uh, production uh, uh, projects than there are. As a result, you know, lots of unsustainable uh, projects get undertaken and then it turns out can't be completed. That's what causes the bust. So the libertarian view is that that's caused by, uh, by government. Um, so the, um, you know, the claim is that the reason you've got large firms then that are in a position to exploit things like this, uh, you know, that doesn't come out of nowhere, they're becoming so large, is usually the result of the fact that they are in some way being insulated from competition. Because, you know, if they're getting, if they're, you know, to the extent that they're getting rich legitimately, it's because they're doing something that people are willing to pay them for. But uh, if you're free to imitate them, and do whatever it is that they're doing, then some of that's going to come your way. I mean, there may be sort of, you know, brand loyalty effects and various kinds of things, but there's, you know, which can create some inequality. But the kind of massive inequality you get, it seems hard to see, just see brand loyalty as sustaining all that. Um, so, uh, you know, so that's why uh, we see the the markets as more of a of a leveling force and of sort of existing historical markets uh, are dominated these big firms. So the question is, what's the reason for that? And you know, our argument is the reason is that the, the regulatory hoops are more difficult for smaller firms or for individuals or workers co-ops or whatever uh, you know, to jump through. Uh, someone who hasn't asked yet? No one? All right. Here we go. So touching again upon like, the private uh, protection agencies, I feel like the, the way you described it would be more like an anarcho-capitalist perspective of like you have a choice between one that's more prone to causing to do violence and, and rather than mediation. How is that like a leftist position? It seems as though you have a choice and you choose between the two that you can able to decide. Because I feel as though like, that's more capitalist as though like, well, it's a market. Um, the uh, what I see as capitalism is essentially uh, the you know the, sep the separation of workers from ownership and management. The separation between a an employing class and an employed class. I think that is sort of essential to. Uh, to capitalism, but simply having market competition and choosing among different service providers, um, I see that as a market phenomenon, but not as a, not necessarily as capitalism. Capitalism is when uh, you have this kind of class separation. You have large groups of people who are who have no who have no access to uh, you know, resources for production of their own, and therefore have to work for someone else. Um, and that's what I think is the result not of markets, but of government intervention. Doesn't mean there'd be no wage labor at all in a, you know, in a truly free market. But it means there wouldn't be a wage system. It wouldn't be this systematic reliance on having to work for someone else. If for some reason you wanted to work for someone else because you know, it was just more convenient for somebody, you know, that would be fine. But uh, uh, but anyway, so that's why I say capitalism is that is that kind of the domination of an employing class. But just having different service providers and choosing among them, that I don't see as and that's not what I mean by capitalism. Uh, yes. In the slide that this gentleman referred to earlier, where you had the large group of people and the politician on the end encouraging us to walk off so that the top was over the cliff, one of the problems I see is increasing criminalization of people's desire to walk off and uh, mandate that you stay on your end of the plant. And uh, you know, non participation is being incre increasingly condemned and punished by the state. But the practical question, what do you do when the state says you can't get off your end of the plank? Well, getting off the, the stepping off the plank isn't a single all or nothing thing. It's, you know, it's a complex collection of many different things. So, you know, it's a, so it's a collection of some things that are legal, some things that are illegal but are still fairly easy to get away with doing, and some things that are illegal and are virtually impossible to get away with doing. Um, but yeah, so it's a range, and um, uh, you know, there's a lot of things you can do that are still legal, also things you can do that, you know, that are illegal but not that hard to get away with uh, that people are doing. Um, 
you know, again, that's not all or nothing. But yeah, it's a difficult problem. Obviously, the you know the state doesn't uh, yeah, doesn't want this to happen. Um, now, the state is you know, I think the state is you know is enough in the you know sort of you know violent aggression mindset that they're you know they still think of the of you know those who are going to violently attack it as like the main enemy to be concerned with. But um, you know, but they know that. Just people peacefully withdrawing is a threat to them too. So clearly they want to stop it. Um, some ways of stopping it are, you know, are easier for them to do than others. Uh, yeah. It's you know, it's hard to know how how successful this this is, is going to be. Uh, but I think that the the state is facing the problem that the, the there are tools it relies on, like the internet, that also make this kind of withdrawal much more easy for people. And they don't want to stop that, but they don't want to kill the goose that laid the golden egg. I mean, they could just they could just say we hereby ban the internet, but they're not going to do that. They'll try to regulate it, but there's a limit to how much they can regulate it and still make it useful in the ways that they need it to be useful. Um, yeah, because you know, I know in one extreme we got North Korea, sort of the extreme of a, a government that has decided um, you know has decided uh, not to let anyone step off, but um, yeah, and there's virtually no real internet uh, available in North Korea. Really. But, you know, yeah, the extension of North Korea is not great. And, you know, it's not really great for the ruling class, but still, that's not quite the model that most governments really want to, you know, want to imitate. Yeah? And this is an inequality question to follow up on something that Dick raised earlier. Uh, it seems to me that when you look around at various areas that seem to be without government intervention, like um, music production, or acting, or athletics, there's enormous differences in equality and income because the value of people's efforts varies enormously. So some people's musical abilities are worth $100 million, and others are worth possibly negative. <laughs> negative. And with acting, you get these discrepancies as well. It looks as though you get it in management, some people can drive a company into the ground. Others, like Steve Jobs, can build the biggest company in the world. And um, that's the, very, the difference between the least able and the most able is just enormous. There's this enormous range. So why isn't it the case that, that when you see enormous inequality, that's a sign that markets are working really well without intervention, that you've got this natural inequality and it's being recognized by the markets as in music, as in acting, and, uh, acting. Well, I, I think that those markets are not as free from government intervention as you're thinking. So let's take music in particular. I'm, given that I think that copyrights are a, uh, a violation of property rights rather than a property right, um, a lot of the economic disparity in the music industry is obviously driven by copyright. And of course, the, and the main beneficiaries uh, of that have to Although the, the most successful musicians obviously make a lot of money, the main beneficiaries are the, you know, the music production companies, not the individual uh, artists. Uh, but um, but uh, I think that you know, there are artificially high profits there because of this, um, uh, you know, because of copyright laws. And even the most successful artists are not the primary beneficiaries uh, of those. So I think without copyright protection, You'd see, um, you, know, you wouldn't see as dramatic you know, levels of profit, and as a result, you wouldn't see as big differences. Uh, though there would be some, sure. Um, you know, there are um, you know, there are always going to be you know, people who do things you know, more successfully that people want to pay more. But I think the the um, the kinds of massive differences uh, you know, with where the um, the kind of sort of restrictions on imitations you can do. I think those artificial enhance it. But yeah, will there be some inequality? Sure. But when inequalities start running into the billions of dollars, it's it's really hard uh, to see how that can be. Uh, uh, well, at least it never does seem. As far as I can see, it never does seem to be the result just of, of markets alone. It always seems to be some kind of uh, government privilege involved. And and, and like was of course with. Um, with managers, I mean, I am a skeptic about. Uh, no, I mean, there are exceptions, but on the whole, I'm a skeptic about the 
this idea that uh, a manager is worth so much to the company that the you know that the millions of dollars you pay the manager really is what making the difference. You know, remember what, you know, one of the things I think is that the when you have a large hierarchical firm, it's really hard to determine uh, you know, the value of the contributions of individual people within it because it's not a market in there. And so you've got a bunch of people doing stuff, and the firm is doing well or it's doing badly. It's really hard to tell who is responsible for that. And, you know, and if the natural tendency in our culture is to think, well, the people at the top must be responsible for its success, um, you know, then they'll be nat it'll be natural sort of pay them uh, the zillions. Whereas often, I think that you know, successful companies are often the result of people ignoring management. You know, management comes up with all kinds of crazy rules. You know, this is certainly true in you know, universities. The you know, administration <laughs> comes up with all kinds of crazy rules, and if you really followed all the rules and filled out all the paperwork exactly the way you're supposed to, you wouldn't have any time to teach. And so you just sort of route around it. Um, you, uh, you, know, you fulfill those requirements in the most half-assed way you can, and then go back to doing what you're supposed to do. Um, you know, there's, a, there's a labor strategy called work to rule, which is a form of going on strike. It's like a slowdown, where you just literally follow all the rules that the management gives you instead of usually evading them as you usually do. And we do that productivity falls, and it's, you know, it's an actually form of industrial action. <laughs> the university is hired the least offensive managers. I mean, they have a different criteria for <laughs> Well, we have, the, we have the least offensive managers because we are a partly uh, worker controlled, uh, you know, the, the power of, you know, by work, the faculty part of the workers, not the other workers, but the, um, the, you know, the, uh, you know, universities are as nice a place to work as they do because they come closer to being a workers cooperative, but still, you know, administrations act the way they have the incentive to act. Uh, you would like. Yes, yes. Um, you kind of let the nice thing about what I was going to ask about. Um, so you mentioned um, these grassroots-based actions. I was going to ask, in the workplace, what does this um, stepping away from the support of our overlords kind of thing, how that pans out? So it looked like traditional WW tactics, which are shop floor solidarity unionism, strikes, withholding labor or work into workers, <coughs> industrial sabotage, or doing just the smallest amount of work to qualify as doing work for paycheck, um, while not really, well, while not intentionally obstructing the productivity of your employer's business. Does it look like those things to do these kind of actions? Yeah, I think those would be legitimate uh, tactics. I mean, a lot of libertarians have this view that, that when you work for an employer, you are obligated to work your best and hardest for them. But they never think that the employer is obligated to pay you the most that they possibly can manage to. <laughs> it was supposed to be a, you know, a meeting of, you know, of, of you know, it's supposed to be a, a theory of you know, a mutually beneficial trade among equals. If that's the theory, then you know, this sort of asymmetry in the expectations is, is trouble. Yes? So like, to play devil's advocate, like, say we have some Grecian boss for king, who, although being- I, I'm available. <laughs> <laughs> I will betray the whole libertarian movement right away if you give me absolute power. <laughs> <laughs> like they, they, although being paternalistic, they dictate what's best for society based on purely utilitarian means. Say that one person perhaps would be better suited to, you know, produce like let's say just some common commodity that is necessary to, to survivability, but they don't want to do that. Often not to force them to do that work if they're able, better able to produce it than some other person. Okay, so well, remember the, the three bases I gave for <laughs> libertarianism. The first is natural rights or self ownership. Uh, you know, even if the, the philosopher king is much wiser than other people, he doesn't have the right to tell them what to do. They own their own lives. <coughs> the second, just on consequentialist grounds, first is the there's the instantival problem, which is. Uh, how do you get a reliable philosopher king? Uh, you know, there are a lot of people who will put themselves forward for the job, as you just saw. But uh, you know, the danger is that they have the incentive to abuse power. But third, even if you can manage to get the most saintly person in there possible, the, you know, the information you need to run the economy is distributed. It is very hard to collect it all in one person's head. Now, that doesn't mean that in particular cases, you might not be able to be in a better position than someone else know what they could do. I don't agree with the people who say, 
you can never know what, some, what, what someone's better for than, better than, than, than themselves. I don't think that's true. But if you're talking about a social system, um, uh, you know, the uh, information doesn't travel well in hierarchies. People, you know, it's hard for people at the top to know all the stuff they need to know to run the whole system. And people are going to get better at making those decisions themselves, mostly, even though there will be exceptions. But you can't base the system on the exceptions. Yes. Short question. Well, what's the largest functioning libertarian society on Earth? There is none. Thank you. <laughs> uh, um, there are, you know, there are societies that. I mean, there are societies that don't really have a functioning state. You know, people often make fun of libertarians by pointing to Somalia and saying, do you want to look like Somalia? And the answer, of course, is no. Um, however, the interesting question is, what, you know, what's the relevant comparison? Do you compare Somalia with you know, life in a Western industrialized democracy? Uh, and Somalia doesn't look so, so great. If you compare Somalia you know, during a stateless period, either with Somalia during a state period, or with other countries in the region that have states, so sort of economically, culturally, historically similar, then Somalia actually looks pretty good compared either to its former state self or to you know, other states in the area. Um, doesn't look good in absolute terms. But you know, that suggests that, you know, that markets may do the best, may do better than states with whatever, you know, whatever the existing historically inherited uh, you know, situation uh, is. You know, of course, you know, there is no you know, there is no existing libertarian society of the kind I favor, but there also doesn't seem to be any existing society of the kind that, you know, that my ideological opponents favor, as far as I can see. I mean, I hear a lot of you know, conservatives talking about uh, limited uh, constitutional government. Well, I don't see that happening anywhere. Um, a lot of liberals talk about uh, a um, you know, progressive government responsive to uh, the people rather than special interests. I don't really see that. Uh, you know, so we're all advocating systems that don't actually exist. Um, uh, so the question is, which systems are possible? Um, and that's largely a matter of trying to figure out, oh, existing systems that don't, that partly work and partly don't. The disagreement is about which aspects of those are the ones that make them kind of work, and which aspects are the ones that make them not. And that's what the, you know, the disagreement is about. If someone keeps serving you, um, uh, mushrooms and pork and you keep getting sick, you know, it might be the mushrooms or it might be the pork. Um, uh, but you know, if, all the, if you know, all the existing dishes seem to have both, it's, you know, it's, it's, it's hard to tell empirically, but then you can go by you know, your best theories, your best understanding, looking at historical examples that have part of what you want but not all of it and try and understand uh, what seems to be the right account. Yes? Uh, how do you feel about your ilk being associated with types like Scott Walker? Um, well, we all have our crosses to bear. Um, <laughs> the, uh, you know, the, um, you know, uh, the left wingers have Stalin, the right wingers have Hitler, and we've got Scott Walker. So, <laughs> well, then, it is. I mean, it's, you know, well, seriously, it's it's part of the dynamic that. Um, that I was talking about, the right conflationism, that advocates of sort of big business interests will tend to use the libertarian rhetoric. Um, in fact, they probably, you know, probably uh, the most prominent uses of libertarian rhetoric, because the, the people who actually have some kind of power are the ones most likely to be heard, the most prominent uses of libertarian rhetoric in our society are by defenders of corporatism. Um, and if they're holding elected office, that's almost certainly uh, the case, you know, some of them are better than others, but um, I don't blame leftists for being suspicious of libertarian rhetoric because it has so often been used uh, to, um, you know, to support uh, very nasty corporatist things. You know, of course, you know, leftist rhetoric has been used to support some pretty nasty things too. Uh, so, if I'm going to be libertarian leftist, I'm supposed to have to, you know, bear the burden of both of that. Uh, you know, leftists are suspicious of me because I think that I'm, uh, they think that I'm uh, you know, offering them you know, corporate rule in uh, leftist clothing. But a lot of libertarians are suspicious of me. They think I'm uh, you know, offering them communism in, in, uh, you know, in free market clothing. Um, 
Uh, and you know, those are reasonable suspicions to have because uh, you know, those in power tend to co-opt the, you know, the language and the ideas of those who are opposing them.